Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is, of course, Michael Granado. I'm a history and philosophy educator, and for me, it is that time of year again. That time of year, it's going to be the start of the fall semester in a few days. And typically speaking, before my semester starts, I have to like prepare my syllabus, kind of lay out the class, make sure I get all my emails sent out and all the information's correct and everything posted online so that way the students have a nice, clean start to their semester. Now, putting together a syllabus is pretty boring overall. I mean, don't get me wrong, teaching is... I don't want to say an easy job. I absolutely love teaching. It's what I've always wanted to do. Putting together a syllabus is not the most exciting part of the job. Maybe that's how I'll phrase it. But um, inevitably, when I'm, I'm teaching, let me back up a little bit, because I'm teaching American history this fall at a college level. It's going to be the first time I'm teaching American history in about three, four years American history proper. Uh, I've been teaching at a high school level and I teach like, you know, U.S. government and certain aspects of American history, but it's at a project-based school. So I'm not like lecturing. I'm not teaching from a textbook like I am this fall. So it, it's it's been a minute going back through my sources, putting everything together and inevitably, when I'm putting together this class, I, I start off with the syllabus. And my the big question with any history class is, where do you start? Where is this class going to begin? And for me, with my college history classes, I actually like to start with kind of a brief introduction and discussion about historical methodology, how historians do history, what history is, how we approach the past, how we approach the study of the past, especially considering the popularity of a lot of conspiratorial thinking and conspiracy theories. What I'm talking about here, of course, is like ancient aliens, but more importantly, when dealing with U.S. history specifically, because it tends to be one of my more contentious classes, there's a lot of issues and problems surrounding uh, political misrepresentation, political conspiracy theories, that sort of thing. So I like to start off the class by, by talking about what history is as a discipline. And of course, that gets me thinking because my, because my background in French philosophy, the history of French philosophy, and the history of, of science in France, uh, I studied Gaston Bachelard, Bachelard wrote a lot about the history of science. And there's a couple of French philosophers that are engaging with science and writing about the history of science. They become known as kind of the French epistemological school of the early 20th century. And they wrote a lot about how what the history of science could tell us about the study of science proper. And by doing so, they engaged on a very fundamental level with historical methodology, engage with some of the more epistemological questions, such as whether or not the history of science is continuous or discontinuous. Of course, in that school of thought with thinkers like Alexander Coré and Thomas Kuhn, they would argue that the history of science is, is discontinuous. It's the replacement of one paradigm with another paradigm. I'm getting completely off track here, but I say all that to say that when I when I start these history classes and I start talking about historical methodology and the nature of history, thinking about how we approach history as a discipline, one of the first things that comes to mind are these, for me anyway, are these questions of epistemology, these questions of historical knowledge and how we come to have knowledge or can we have knowledge about the past. And so that was kind of the inspiration for this video, kind of an informal approach to history, approach to the study of history that um, basically I was just thinking about. So I decided to, to, to make this video. But one of the first questions I like to ask my class just to get their perception about what it is that we're going to be doing and to get their kind of assumptions coming into the class is I like to raise this question and to get their feedback. What is history? And like when you think about history, what do you think about? What's the first thing that comes to mind? 
And this starts a good discussion because some of the first things that people will say, generally speaking, are like, you know, history, of course, studies the past. And I ask, well, what past are we talking about? And we can kind of narrow it down because history is not like geology. It's not the study of like the natural environment and the study of how, how the continents formed or anything like that. It's the study of, of humans specifically. This is also what separates history from like anthropology, for example, because history is focused on human beings and not our pre-human ancestors. Although what happened in humans evolutionary past certainly does impact the history of humanity. I like to talk a little bit about that in my World History One class, but usually I'll get something along those lines to start off. And then when I ask students, like, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of history, there are always these little like quotes and sayings that, that inevitably a, a student will bring up because it's just kind of in our popular consciousness, so to speak. And, and one of those quotes that I like to focus on that a student will say is that history is written by the victors. You've probably heard this phrase before. I'm not going to go into the origins of this phrase. I don't know where it comes from. I'm sure somebody in the comment section can tell us. But this is one of those things that, for whatever reason, is ingrained ingrained into people's minds and it's it's usually one of the things they bring up and I'm I that's one of the things I'm I'm fishing for because it highlights an important aspect of history that I like to talk about and that's kind of where history fits in the academic ladder so to speak so history's a unique discipline because on the one hand it's not a science it's not a quote unquote hard science it's not a mathematical science right you can't do an equation to to reveal some fundamental truth some sort of fundamental historical truth about like george washington or the establishment of the american democracy right there's no there's no algebra equation for that but also with respect to historical research there's no um studies or experiments or any sort of empirical observations in terms of first person empirical observations that go into historical research what historians are primarily dealing with, of course, are primary and secondary sources, expert opinions, kind of responding to that expert opinions, formulating arguments concerning interpretations of various events that have happened. So it's not scientific in the way that like biology or chemistry are scientific. So there's a different sort of methodology that's being employed. And usually when I bring that up, what happens is students start to go to the opposite end of the spectrum and they start to suggest that, well, since history is written by the victor, there's this sort of innate and inherent bias to historical writing. So historical writings are inherently deceptive almost. And then as a result, we can't really know the past, that history at a very basic level is fictitious, possibly. And so I kind of push back against that a little bit by suggesting that, so on the one hand, you have the natural sciences, and on the other hand, you might have something like literature and creative writing. And in creative writing, there are certainly tools and techniques that can, you can use and implement, but you can't really evaluate the credibility of creative writing on the on the basis of whether or not it like corresponds to reality that's the whole creative bit right it doesn't necessarily have to correspond to reality that's part of the fun of it so on the one hand history is not a science but on the other hand we can't simply just make things up there are historical facts in history in the same way that there might be facts about the natural physical world in the sciences. But historical facts are, are slightly different. And I have a different video that kind of discusses and breaks down historical facts. I might make another one talking about that with my more updated perspective. The video I have up is, is quite old, but maybe it's time to to review that material. But I bring this up because it leaves us in this kind of awkward position because we're not dealing with the level of certainty about the physical world that we have in disciplines such as physics by any stretch of the imagination when we talk about the past. 
But at the same time, we're not dealing with complete speculation, uh, making things up or attributing causes that weren't there when we talk about history. There are some facts, some brute facts, so to speak, that we have to work with and that we have to make sense of and that we can't necessarily avoid. So how is it, what does this mean for history as a discipline? And that was kind of the inspiration for this video. Another inspiration, since I had some free time, I was doing some reading and there was a book that I read in graduate school that I would highly recommend. It's called History in Three Keys. It's a history of the Chinese Boxer Rebellion that took place in the early 20th century. Chinese history, not my strong suit, not my forte, but hands down, this is one of the best books that I've ever read. Um, and it's a book about the Chinese Box Rebellion, yes, but it's also a book about historical methodology. And the author, uh, Dr. Paul Cohen, um, talks about the Boxer Rebellion as, to use his own words, event, experience, and myth. And he talks about the ways in which we form and structure history. And I really like his first couple of chapters because it highlights some of the features that I like to discuss with my classes in the first couple of weeks of class to kind of prep them and prepare them for uh, how we're going to be approaching history. So I want to start off with this definition of history that Cohen introduces and then proceeds to dissect. And I also want to get into kind of Cohen's dissection of this definition, some of the problems that it presents. But Cohen provides this definition at the beginning of his book, and he says kind of the popular level common understanding of history. History, in short, has an explanatory function. The historian's objective is, first and foremost, to understand what happened in the past and then to explain it to his or her readership. And Cohen immediately recognizes that this kind of common understanding of history comes with some really fundamental problems. The first has to deal with the past and the nature of the past and the nature of memory and remembrance. And the second has to do with the nature and the method of explanation, specifically the sort of explanation that's used in historical scholarship, uh, most importantly, that of narrative, how narratives explain historical events. So why is the past a problem for history? And, and this kind of speaks to the intersection of history, uh, history and philosophy, and it actually relates to some of the research that I've been doing recently related to the uh, philosophy of time, actually, and what exactly the philosophy of time means, for example, uh, the implications of it for things like memory. I actually just published a paper uh, related to Gaston Bachelard's philosophy of time and the importance for memory, the importance that it has for memory. Um, I've shared it recently on my YouTube channel. I'll make a video about it soon enough. But why is the past a problem? Well, the past is a problem for a few reasons. The most obvious of reason is that the past is not something that is immediately accessible to us as humans. It's not something like when you're dealing with science and you're dealing with scientific experimentation, you're dealing with experimentation that's happening in the present. And even if you're referring to experiments that happened in the past. These have been meticulously recorded. Well, that's not usually the case with history. Now, with more modern history, we have a ton of data. So if you're dealing with some more recent events, specifically events that happened in the 20th century, if you're talking, for example, about World War I and World War II, then yes, you're dealing with an overwhelming amount of primary sources related to those events. But the further back in history you go, the less tangible those sources and evidence get. And so oftentimes what you're dealing with and what you're working with is indirect evidence. The past is not something that we can directly engage with. The other problem is the problem of memory, the problem of remembrance, because memory for human beings 
I've often talked about how we have a, a lot of misconceptions about memory, kind of popular level misconceptions. And the first one that we have, right, I'm using a computer right now, and there's often this comparison of human memory to the memory, how memory operates on a computer. So if I want to, for example, I've, I've pulled up the PowerPoint that I've created here, it's stored on my computer's memory. All I do is click a few buttons and voila, my PowerPoint is pulled up exactly how I last saved it. And so there's this idea, this analogy that's drawn between computer memory and human memory, that human memory operates essentially in the same way, that we have these files, so to speak, of our past in our brain, and that when we remember a past event, we're retrieving that past event and bringing it to the present. The problem from a psychological standpoint is that's not really how memory works at all. There's always a level of interpretation or reinterpretation when a human being remembers a past event. One of the things I like to bring up to my students because it still boggles my mind, you can think about this in terms of your own personal experience. So one of the things that happens to me, especially when I think of childhood memories, in my memories, I'm I see myself like in as I'm like as if I'm watching a movie, right? I'm I'm watching myself do some actions. And that's of course a a, a reconstruction. I've added a lot to those memories because I'm not standing outside of myself. I experienced those events in first person, but now somehow I'm seeing them in third person. Memory is, of course, incredibly unreliable to begin with. We misremember things. We also recreate things. But on a very basic level, when we recall something, it's not a pure recall. It's not an exact recall. We're always recalling that event in light of our present. And sometimes when that happens, there's a basic level of reinterpretation that we might not even necessarily be aware of. So the past is a problem, A, because it's inaccessible to us. And so historians can never recover the past as it is, or as it was, so to speak. And B, even if we're dealing with a firsthand recollection of the past, even if we're dealing with the observation of, of, of data or things that were recorded, whether written or video recording, inevitably on some level, maybe not necessarily with video recording, it's a bad example, but with written recording on some level where, where there's an element of interpretation or reinterpretation that the author of that source may not even necessarily be aware that they're doing. But the, the problem goes deeper than that. That's just kind of surface level considerations that, well, it's like, oh, of course that happens, right? But again, think about this in terms of your own life. If, if I were to ask you to write an autobiography, and you can see this clearly in a lot of different autobiographies, what, think for a second about what that autobiography would look like. It's a good thought experiment because inevitably what happens when you think about writing something like an autobiography, you have certain events in your mind that happened to you in the past that you want to include and that you want to write about. And the reason why you have focused on those things inevitably is because you're constructing a story about yourself, about your life, and kind of the course and the direction that your life has taken and that your life is going in. So your autobiography is a selection of certain events. And inevitably what happens in that selection is that other events are gonna be left out, even excluding the fact that you probably don't remember those events, right? You don't remember most of the things that have, unless you have some crazy photographic memory, right? Most human beings don't remember every single day of their life. And every single day of their life, different things have happened to them. So in our, our, our memory naturally excludes some things that it deems to be unimportant, right? You don't remember every single time you go to Starbucks and order a coffee because that's not incredibly important. And if you're somebody like me, 
who has a massive coffee addiction and you go out on a regular basis, right? You're going to the coffee shop at least once a day. We don't have to keep talking about that though. We can move on to the next example. So your brain naturally excludes, especially events that it deems like mundane or events that you repeatedly do. You don't remember every single time you've brushed your teeth or taken a shower. There might be, maybe you had a traumatic fall in a shower. So there's a few times that you explicitly remember or something along those lines. But we exclude certain things from our story. Even the events that we do remember, we're not going to write an autobiography. There are some things that we're not going to talk about just because we don't place a lot of value or derive a lot of meaning from those things. So there's going to be something left out. And it's the same when dealing with history. History is not the record of every single thing that has ever happened. That would be an almost infinite amount of sources, right? It wouldn't be infinite. Um, but you can imagine how complicated that will get. And just think, for example, again, even if we limit ourselves to a, a single historical event, Take World War II again. That's the probably the most impactful, one of the most impactful, important events that happened in the 20th century. Think what it would take to just to do a day by day analysis of World War II. First and foremost, you would have to choose like, well, which comp, which country are you going to focus on? Are you going to focus on a particular branch of the military? Are you going to focus on a particular general? To do an entire recap of the Second World World War, even just a single day in it, taking in consideration all of the different sources, you're talking about a huge textbook. I mean, it would be unmanageable even just for a single day, just due to the sheer amount of sources that we have concerning that event. So inevitably, there's going to be something left out. And inevitably, the historian's going to have to decide what's important and what's not important. So going back to Cohen, this is what another quote that he has to say, at minimum, all historical writing, even the best of it, entails a radical simplification and compression of the past. So even if the historian is acutely aware of the biases that they have, even if they're acutely aware of the type of information that they're going to focus on, even if the World War II historian says, okay, I'm only going to focus on the British Royal Air Force, for example, and its fight against Nazi Germany. And even if we're just going to, even if we're going to say like, okay, just the Battle of Britain, I'm just going to give you a history of the British Royal Air Force during the Battle of Britain. Even then, and let's say it's like a, a thousand page book. I'm sure there's one out there, right? Even then it's a simplification because you're not considering all the data and you're still picking and still choosing what to include and what not to include. And so at best, history is a simplification of what happened. And with this simplification comes a need to organize and to explain that data. So that goes back to that second point, the second problem of explanation. So even if we have these facts that we've chosen, how are we gonna put those facts together how are we going to explain those facts? And this gets into the uh, question of historical narrative and the role that narrative plays in historical methodology is something that um, is, is still being discussed and debated by historians and philosophers of history. It's, it's a big conversation. It kind of ramped up in the 60s and 70s where there was this massive critique of meta narrative by a lot by several different postmodern philosophers and this of course creeped its way into historical methodology because one of the primary means of explanations that historians utilize is that of narrative so there's this question of if we're calling into question the basis of meta narrative what role and what importance can, can we apply those same critiques to to narrative itself and what role does narrative fundamentally play in historical research and in historical methodology. And why this is important in terms of a bias, um, I thought it would be interesting to share 
a quote from John Barth's book, The End of the Road. And this is what Barth has to say. And this is from a, a, a novel, but I think it, it still highlights an important point. In life, he said, there are no essentially major or minor characters. To that extent, all fiction and biography and most historiography are a lie. Everyone is necessarily the hero of his own life story. Hamlet can be told from Polonius's. I'm, I haven't, I, I'm ashamed to admit that I haven't read Hamlet. I'm not sure how to pronounce these characters' names. Hamlet can be told from Polonius's point of view and called the tragedy of Polonius, Lord Chamberlain of Denmark. He didn't think that he was a minor character in anything, I dare say. Sorry, I had to change this to full screen so I can read it. Um, the second paragraph, though, maybe a, a better example, other for those of us who haven't read Hamlet, or suppose you're an usher in a wedding. From the groom's viewpoint, he's the major character. The others play in supporting parts, even the bride. From your viewpoint, though, the wedding is a minor episode and a very interesting history of your life, and the bride and the groom are minor figures. So I really like this quote that we are all the heroes of our own story because it highlights one of the basic biases that are present in narratives. And it's it's easy to highlight when thinking about it in the terms of your own life because you are the most important person in your life for obvious reasons. It's your life, but you're going to ascribe importance to events and to actions that you do in a way that you're not going to do for other people. And it's not, that's not to say that you're selfish. Everybody does this because we have to do this in order to provide basic care for ourselves. But it it's also natural in the way that we form narrative, in the way that we form our life narratives, we view our actions and our events as more important, even if, to use this example, even if we are in somebody else's wedding, we don't frame our participation in that wedding as them being more important. We're solely thinking about our role. And this is something that just comes natural to us as humans. And so when utilizing narrative, you see this play out in historical narratives. Going back to that original quote that I say that students always bring up, that history is written by the victor, what this highlights, especially if you're looking at a nation's narrative, especially if you're looking at a nation's history, you see this, for example, um, creeping in to nation's textbooks, especially that they assign like on a K through 12 level of how the nation wants to present itself, how it wants to portray itself, how it wants to portray its own history. It's going to be the hero, whatever nation you're from, the United States, Denmark, whatever, whatever nation you're from, you go read the textbooks that they give to little kids and it's going to present them in a positive light because we want our children, this gets into propaganda, again, a, a road that I don't necessarily want to go down in this video, but the idea is to prove that we're presenting ourselves in a particular light by excluding, especially by excluding um, other events, other documents, other things that have happened and telling the story in a particular way. All of this is to say, that at its core, at its basis, history has to grapple and face with some very serious epistemological problems that historians on the whole don't have, I don't want to say don't have great answers to it. It's still very much so up for discussion and up for debate in many respects. But this is not to say that even if we accept the fact that there's an inherent bias in narrative, and even if we accept kind of the truth that's being relayed in the quote that history is written by the victors, that's even if we accept that, we can also still recognize that alternative narratives also exist. So especially when teaching about U.S. history, one of the things that we kind of have to hold in opposition, in juxtaposition to each other, are the different narratives that are happening simultaneously with each other 
And these narratives are oftentimes in conflict with one another. One of the examples I like to give of, of what I mean by this when dealing with U.S. history specifically and when dealing with U.S. political history in the history of political philosophy in the United States. I like to take a more focus on kind of intellectual history because of my philosophy background. And two of the narratives that we have to hold in tension, for example, is on the one hand, we have these very noble, bright, kind of very, for the time, radical ideas of political liberty, right? This is famously embodied in Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we have these noble ideas, this of course coming from the English tradition of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, birth out of the Enlightenment, one of the characteristic features of the Enlightenment is political revolution, is fundamental change that's happening for people that prior to this had not received any sort of political rights. So we have this, on the one hand, this very bright, hopeful, future-focused understanding of liberty, and this is held in contradiction, in hostility to this other idea, which was very prevalent in colonial America. It's one of the reasons why colonial America started. And this is this idea of slavery, that some people actually did not have those rights. And that on the one hand, we're going to build a country that is supposed to embody political liberty. But on the other hand, we're going to ensure that a vast portion of the population of this country does not have access to that liberty. So oftentimes, yes, history is written by the victor, but these counter narratives are still there, chipping away at that history that the victor has written. Another popular example, of course, would be Native American history and the history of Native American peoples, Native American civilization, the influence and the, well, the story of the Americas before the arrival of Europeans, but also the influence and the story of those peoples once the Europeans arrived is another kind of counter narrative. Um, a very popular level example of this would be Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. So yes, history's written by the victor, but I also like to emphasize the victor's position is not the only narrative at our disposal. We have other narratives. And so what this leads to, I want to leave you with a quote by Jill Lepore. I'm, I'm currently reading her book. I, I read portions of her book in preparation for this coming semester. It's called These Truths. I would highly recommend it. It's it's a little thick. Uh, I've, I've read a couple of chapters. I'm going to be reading more chapters throughout the semester. But this is what Dr. Lepore has to say about history and about how we approach history. Only by fits and starts did history become not merely a form of memory, but also a form of investigation to be disputed like philosophy. Its premises question, its evidence examine, its arguments countered. History is the presentation of a narrative, yes, but it's not just the presentation of a single narrative. It's the presentation of many narratives. Sometimes these narratives conflict Sometimes they collide. Sometimes we have to re-examine them in light of new evidence. New evidence comes forward. New documents are found. New archaeological sites are uncovered. So history is the study of the past, but this is a past that is always changing, always open for interpretation, and always open for counter-narratives. So it's not just one-sided. And that's the important takeaway message that I guess I'll leave you all with. Anyway, let me know what you think. I'm more than happy to continue this conversation in the comments section below. For this up and coming semester, I'm, I'm thinking about hope.
hopefully, I'm going to be recording some of the lectures that I give for my U.S. history class. I'm going to try to post those to YouTube or at least post pieces of them to YouTube. If there's a particular subject in U.S. history that you would like me to talk about, I'm teaching U.S. history one. So it's up until Reconstruction, I think, is where they wanted me to stop it shortly after the Civil War. Um, I've got my material planned out, but if there's some supplementary stuff, I'm, I'm always open to suggestions. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you all next time.